Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for August 28th, 2023. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance to the um, regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Leveraging Adaptive Framework for Open Source Data Access Solutions with Jeremy Greesup. Uh, Jeremy is a software engineer at Clemson University and specializes in identity management. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to type questions during the presentation. I'll find a graceful way to interrupt Jeremy between slides, uh, or we'll take questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I'll hand things over to Jeremy. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for joining. As Jeanette mentioned, my name is Jeremy Greesup, and I've worked for Clemson University since 2001. Uh, my primary role has been in software development for the <clears throat> identity management team. And I've also contributed to some commercial products in the identity management space where we provided um, identity integrations with sometimes hundreds or even thousands of Linux and Unix systems. And I've also done quite a bit of integration work with mainframe systems. Um, my work with Clemson University has kind of allowed me to understand more of the enterprise applications that are fundamental to learning institutions. And in, in addition to that, Clemson's always made investments in research. And although my background does not include cyber infrastructure, um, Clemson has often provided me opportunities to discuss um, software solutions with folks in that area. We have recently open sourced a software framework called Adaptive Framework, and it's available on GitHub. You'll find a link to this project both in the uh, topic abstract and later on in this presentation as well. Today, I want to share my experiences with implementing this identity management related framework that we believe has some um, interesting overlap with the needs of other groups, including those of you in research areas. So this is a breakdown of how <clears throat> I plan to divide up my time today. Um, I'm gonna spend about 15 minutes talking about a software project that I was involved with at Clemson University. Um, and I think in, in order to provide you with some background and why we created this framework in the first place. Then I'll transition into um, details about the framework itself, highlighting some of its features. And then I'll spend a, about another 10 to 15 minutes going over two use cases that we believe um, this project may be useful for. And then finally, I'll leave 10 minutes at the end to try to answer any questions. So, um, first, I want to talk about this project called the Clemson Vault and what it was designed for, because I think to really understand adaptive framework, you have to first understand the path that sort of led us there. So the Clemson Vault project began uh, around 2012, so it's been more than 10 years. And there was um, this was a, a list of requirements for this integration. So we had um, we needed ide to identify our identities. And these would be um, any of the users at Clemson University. So that includes uh, faculty, students, staff, uh, contingent workers, guests, alumni, student applicants. And we needed to represent all these identities within our vault database. Then we had resources. And these are the, uh, the things that users own or have access to. And among those include course learning material, um, emailing lists, database, disk storage, collaboration groups, and even uh, building card access. Then we had the relationships um, that tied the identities to the resources. Uh, for instance, a student may be enrolled in a course and an instructor is assigned to teach it. Somebody owns an email list and manages it, but uh, members of the list are also recipients. We needed um, a way to provide automated provisioning and deprovisioning. And so at the part of Clemson's Identity Vault is this, um, this engine or hub that uh, allows us to react to changes that occur in real time. So whenever students apply throughout the year to uh, courses, 
or uh, staff leave the university or students in, enroll in a class. Um, every one of those events that happen uh, triggers some sort of action on our part to take. We also needed um, a web service that provides uh, university applications to access the vault data and, and do so in a secure way. And we also and we had a very evolving schema. So as um, requirements sort of evolved and then new systems and applications were procured uh, and brought online, uh, the schema we had to work with was also very dynamic. And even today, we're adding new um, entities and fields to it. So in these um, next two slides, I'm just going to run through a couple of uh, scenarios so you get sort of a feel for how the data flows in this vault architecture. Um, in this first one, you can see uh, for students, it might go something like this. A person applies to the university, and they become an applicant. And then this applicant may be accepted by admissions, and then uh, once his or uh, her uh, financials are handled, they become a confirmed student. Um, that student may declare a major and then decide which semester they're going to enter and attend classes. In the first semester, they become an active student and they register for classes. And then those uh, course registrations become enrollments and they're provisioned um, into our uh, learning management system. Uh, and then once they go there, we get um, email list listers are, are populated. And then once the student start enrolls in a class, they have access to all these uh, resources. And so once they have access then to our course content management system, they can participate in the learning process, um, access shared documents and collaborate both with the instructor and other students. For faculty members, it's a little bit similar, and it goes something like this. A person's hired by the university as a faculty. The faculty is assigned to teach a set of course sections. And then this relationship is called a faculty assignment. And then that describes you know, the relationship between that user and that course section entity. And then this assignment gets provisioned to our course management system. And now the faculty may access the course management system, which we use uh, Canvas at Clemson. They use that to aid in uh, teaching and provide coursework and eventually gra uh, distribute grades. And this is uh, an architecture diagram of what our Clemson Vault currently looks like. And there's a lot going on in this diagram. Um, and honestly, it's really kind of an oversimplification of what the Clemson Vault entails. But what I kind of want to show you are just all of the applications that participate in our vault and how they interact with each other through this centralized hub that we've uh, engineered. So if you start with the top of the diagram, it's in the dark orange. We have HR system, student registry, and courses. And these are applications that we refer to as publishers or producers because they're the authority of information with respect to their data. They're the ones that produce it. And then we have other systems such as those on the right-hand side and along the bottom. These are applications referred to as subscribers or consumers because they access the data that they subscribe to. And then at the center of the diagram enclosed in the big box are all vendor licensed products. Um, and they're supplied by a company called Microfocus, which is now uh, open text. And uh, th this is the engine that reacts to the data that's changing and provides us the mechanism to take action when that data change occurs. So in this way, it's um, very similar to the concept of an enterprise message bus. And it's here in the central hub that we have all of our custom business rules that uh, massage the data and um, map or transform them into other formats. And it's in the central hub that we also store a lot of data locally. So in this setup, we effectively have uh, duplicate, uh, duplicate copies of a lot of university data. Then finally, on the left-hand side of this diagram is the uh, fault web services, where we provide a RESTful interface uh, into the vault. And this allows many applications, including 
administrative apps, help desk tools, and even some self-service applications to access and manage the data, that, the data that's in the vault where it's deemed appropriate. And I use that phrase because a user or an application that needs access to vault data has to be approved by our security team. The access controls are then enforced by locally stored client keys, along with some custom authorization enforcement code. This shows how we currently maintain our vault in, a, in sort of this continuous process. It starts with our schema. So just like any great idea, we, um, we started everything off in a Google spreadsheet. And um, this was actually a very convenient way to organize how our vault, Clemson vault data looks like in a way that's real easy for humans to understand, but it also provides a good way to, um, to share and collaborate. So we can use, for instance, we can use the Google history tools um, to see who changed a particular data field or when. And um, you might be able to see this from the screenshot here, but it has some columns that describe the object data that we're modeling along with, um, so I apologize if it's not big enough to see that, but there's some descriptions on the right-hand side as well. And these descriptions are handy because this is actually uh, metadata in our system that makes its way through the processing pipeline and eventually into our web service documentation as well. We can also see in that spreadsheet some data types, things like strings, dates, object IDs. And these actually get, um, they translate into generated LDIF code where our Google spreadsheet um, basically allows us to uh, modify our LDAP directory server through a, a series of, of, of manual processes. And the way we do this is in the spreadsheet, there's a, a button that we click and it generates the schema in a XML format. And then we take that copy and we commit it to subversion. And then that schema XML then is uh, run through some XSLT transforms and they produce documentation, uh, PHP web service code, and then, uh, as I mentioned, the LDIF resources for extending our directory schema. So that's sort of the brief um, story of our vault. And so I want to talk about uh, some aspects of our vault design that we really like and want to preserve moving forward. Um, the first is the way that our scheme is managed. It's really nice for, for collaboration. It's easy to read, easy to be changed. Um, the second is the central hub or the engine. One nice thing about this is it uses existing software that we already have uh, licensing for. So this doesn't cost us anything extra. Uh, our, our current team, our identity management group, we have very capable engineers that have been around this software for a long time. And so we're able to maintain and develop the tools that are required for this project implementation. The web services and documentation are fairly self-maintaining. That is through uh, some of our processing steps and code generation, we're able to make a change and deploy updated web service and docs rather easily. And finally, um, we've been able to quickly integrate new and existing apps that are required by Clemson. For example, when the COVID pandemic started, we were very well positioned for apps to be developed and integrated back uh, within our vault data so that students and employees could work and learn remotely and users could uh, schedule COVID tests and, and campus building door access could actually be automatically controlled that way. But the current design also has a few drawbacks to it. Um, right currently, the, the the procedures for making changes is still pretty manual and can be tedious at times. So after you edit the spreadsheet by hand, you've got to run some macros and scripts to to do this conversion. So it's not um, really ideal for eliminating human error. Second, there's really no real authorization built into the current design. Aside from the custom web service keys, we mostly rely on external apps and our own LDAP server for declaring and imposing authorization rules on its data. 
This particular solution, it, it requires the specific vendor licen licensing that we have with OpenText, which is great for us in the short term, but could be a liability down the road if we ever procure a different vendor for doing identity management. And this also makes it, um, it may prohibit the solution from being portable to another institution as well. The solution is not particularly adaptive to other newer technologies such as cloud object storage or even web services written in uh, languages other than PHP. We may not want to store data centrally, and it would be more idea if some of the data could be accessed when it was needed, but only stored in the database from which it's created instead of being um, duplicated. And then this final point sort of highlights one of the biggest motivations for presenting this framework to you today, which is that we need this project to be sustainable in the long term. And this means uh, expanding its use Clemson University and trying to grow a community that can help support it. So now that I've covered the background of the Vault project, I can talk more about this software framework called Adapter Framework and how it emerged. Um, so let me just quickly go over some of the main features of Adapter Framework. Uh, first, we needed the software that runs or that our Vault runs on to be more generalized and adaptive to technologies that other institutions may use. So for this reason, we created a software core that defines some primitive features, such as data types and functions. Then we allowed for this core framework to be extendable so that other features could be just plugged in later. We replaced the, the, the parts that were supplied by, um, by the licensed software, namely the provisioning engine, and created a custom implementation that would cover the use cases that we needed for our vault. We added an authorization feature to the framework. So if you recall, our previous vault didn't really have one. We created an, a language called Adaptive Script, and this would allow for real complex customizations to be written without having to change any of the compiled parts to our framework. We created um, something called layouts, which are designed to allow user interfaces to be easy to create by leveraging metadata and some simple processing rules. We created um, an admin interface to help configure and administer the deployment of adaptive framework applications. And finally, we um, sort of crafted this containerized dev environment, which I'll talk more about later, um, along with some really helpful tools to build um, applications that may use our framework. So there's eight things that I'm just gonna go through. I've got eight more slides that kind of cover each one of these things in just a little bit more detail. The first of those features I described was this extension architecture. And this allows developers to implement and contribute features through shared libraries, which can be deployed by an application using adaptive framework environment. And the idea is that these extensions, they could be open source or they could be privately licensed, um, available to customers that are using the framework. And then once they're installed, they can be loaded or plugged in. And additional features will automatically be registered for use. So one, one way we could do this is by creating some sort of uh, marketplace where you could go to get extensions. And some examples of these extensions or these features may include additional data types and functions, content types to help uh, parse and serialize object data. So think JSON, XML, YAML, um, object adapters that can store, uh, persist and retrieve object data. For instance, cloud-based object stores or local databases. And request handlers um, to implement communication techniques for clients who may understand um, specific protocols, such as customized REST or custom SOAP requests. The next feature of adaptive framework that I want to talk about are called adapters. And adapters allow us to persist object data. Um, an adaptive framework and a, a permanent object data store. 
So an extension that implements our adapter interface provides ways to access these objects through functions. And we've got a list of these um, called like get object, retrieve objects, create, del uh, delete, modify, replace. And so these functions you'll find um, really resemble what you'll discover in most databases or CRUD-like data stores. Adapters can be used to uh, retrieve and store objects in traditional databases, such as Oracle or Postgres, or they could be used in much uh, less structured backends, such as schemaless, um, no SQL object databases. Adapters can also support other useful optional interfaces, such as uh, handling transactions or um, even data indexing. In addition to that, there are a few adapters that we provide out of the box. So one of them is a file adapter. That's pretty simple. It just persists objects as files in a local file system. And there's some real nice conveniences that come with that. For instance, objects can be easily read or edited by people. And it makes them real nice for storing things such as configurations. We also have an LDAP adapter that allows us to work with objects that are stored in an LDAP directory, which is a very common place for organizations to store um, user identities, for instance. And then we have a uh, LMDB, which stands for Lightning Memory Map Database. And this is a local in-memory database. It's very fast, and therefore, this would be a really good adapter for um, to use for accessing objects quickly and efficiently. And because of the extension architecture, other adapters can be created too. So if we wanted to use um, an, another structured database like MySQL or Oracle, or you could use, um, want to connect to like a cloud-based object database like MongoDB, um, for these stores, we would just create an extension and then implement our adapter interface. I discussed a little bit about provisioning in some of the early, earlier slides, but I just want to highlight um, our own design and adapter framework so you can understand its role a little bit better. Um, if you're already familiar with message queues or enterprise message buses, you may see a lot of resemblance here. So we came up with this concept called a journal uh, to record event data and store them chronologically. So they um, could be processed later in order, just like a queue. Clients can be set up to add events to the journal by recording structures called journal entries, and then clients take them off sequentially. The clients that take them off are called consumers, and we mark their current position in the queue by an index called a cursor. How we actually store the journal is actually up to an extension that supports our journaling interface. For instance, we have a couple of implementations available in the framework. One uses, again, the file-based system, or excuse me, the file system-based journal, and one uses a journal based on LMDB or the Lightning Memory Map database. Both have um, some advantages and disadvantages for recording journal entries. Um, but because we created the extendable interface to journals, it's also possible to use other technologies to provide journaling features, such as cloud-based databases or, or even popular uh, enterprise message queues. And we, again, do this by just developing a, an extension. Authorization is the next feature I want to talk about. Um, and Authorization is a pretty broad topic to explore in, in such a little amount of time. So I'm going to do my best to kind of just summarize things here. So this, um, I've kind of broken down and identified three strategies that people use to control who has access to data. And uh, these categories are access control lists, um, role-based access control, or RBAC, and attribute-based access control. So. The first one, access control list, are probably the simplest to sort of understand. File systems often use these to grant lists of users or groups permissions to a file or folder. And they're also pretty easy to implement, but they don't offer a lot of fine grain control. Role based or RBAC, and it has some variations as well, um, they allow you to put custom uh, roles to, that can be created and assigned to users. So, for example, administrator or supervisor 
or uh, HR. And then those roles can often be structured like a tree. So the permissions can be inherited that way. And then finally, we have attribute-based access control, which is probably the most flexible. It considers attributes that live on the user, attributes on the resource being accessed, and even attributes in an environment in order to determine and render, uh, render an authorization outcome. ZACML is a, um, an example of an attribute-based system, if you ever heard of ZACML. Um, it has some heavy influence over how we chose to model authorization in adaptive framework. And more generally, um, ZACML sort of asks the question, does a subject have access to a resource in a given environment? And in adaptive framework, the way that we've implemented authorization is we currently support um, auth logic written through um, adaptive scripts, but we also intend at some point to reintegrate ZACL back into the framework as well. Adaptive scripts is the next feature I want to talk about. Um, it also happens to be my favorite feature of the framework. So um, at the beginning, you know, in order to provide some dynamic runtime customizations to the framework, we allowed for user input to be plugged into configuration files. And then eventually we extended those inputs to include um, sort of like templates and expressions. And then these provided ways to let little snippets of code to execute in certain contexts. For instance, if we want to customize um, filters for logging data or come up with some sort of calculation to map data. And then eventually um, these little snippets of code turned into a full blown language called adaptive script. And adaptive script, it's pretty cool because it looks a lot like JavaScript syntax. In fact, it's, um, it's nearly, it's, nearly uh, it's called uh, 262 conformant to ECMAScript standards. But it also has direct access to all of our C-level functions that are provided by the adaptive framework core and extensions. So this means that if you were to like load an extension with special functions in it, um, the adaptive script will actually be able to invoke them. And one big reason that we chose a very JavaScript looking syntax for our language is because JavaScript already has a lot of features that make working with object data real easy. And in addition to that, JavaScript's a very popular modern language. So we hope that that syntax will also help with our own adoption. We envision adaptive script to be used for implement, uh, implementing authorization, data transforms, and provisioning logic. And currently, we even use it to test the framework itself. And by the way, this there's a screenshot in this slide. Um, you get to kind of see what one of our development time tools looks like. It's called Fiddle, which I'll talk a lot about more later. It's a web-based editor um, for writing adaptive script that has some really nice auto completion and documentation in line with the source code that you're writing. So we think this would be really helpful for developers. Layouts are part of adaptive framework that's still a bit under design right now. Um, but the idea is that layouts are there to assist developers in creating user interfaces behind web, web applications. So we can um, help by providing UI components to understand object data by examining its metadata. For instance, an object property may be described as a string of alphanumeric characters with a min or max length might support plain text or regex patterns. And then we use all that information to render the appropriate UI layout that supports those requirements. We sort of envision layouts supporting both simple and more complex use cases, offering developers um, sort of this freedom to, to and most of the framework is kind of like this. It's the freedom to choose how much of the integration you wish to pull from adaptive framework or how much you wish to use of your own tools and technologies. The administrative UI, um, so adaptive framework makes just about everything configurable and extendable, if you haven't gathered that so far from this presentation. Um, and so you can always create and edit configuration files in order to change the behavior of the underlying framework. 
But in addition to that, we also created an admin UI that offers a way to configure it through a modern web app. So some of the admin UI features include the ability to view and con um, configure server and application environments, um, the ability to load extensions, the ability to create stop and start services. Um, you can use the admin UI to, uh, as an object editor to create um, any object that's connected um, via the adapter interfaces. And then you can also write and run adaptive scripts on the server instance through our uh, UI tool fiddle. The final feature of adaptive framework um, that I want to talk about is the development tools that we've created. So in order to provide developers with a successful experience with Adaptive Framework, we provided the following tools to aid them in the process. Um, first, we published Docker containers for production and development environments. And the dev environment is automatically set up with all the low level build tools, such as compilers and, and debuggers. And it's also uh, easily integratable with um, Visual Studio Code, which is a really popular IDE tool that we highly recommend using. Second, we ship some development time command line tools called uh, AFW Dev, which has all the it has all sorts of features for building and maintaining a, uh, a source code project based on adaptive framework. And as I mentioned, we have Fiddle, the web-based editor, uh, which understands adaptive script and can use to write and debug code by evaluating it in the dev environment. And then finally, we provide some extensive uh, documentation reference. And this is all kept up to date through uh, data generation techniques. OK, so I've, I've gone over the Clemson vault. I've covered the emerging software called Adaptive Framework and its feature set. So this third and final segment of this discussion, I want to focus on two use cases uh, that I think would be useful for Adaptive Framework. Um, in the first, I'm going to revisit authorization and see how um, Adaptive Framework could be used for a more general purpose Auth-Z system. And then finally, I'll look at an example of how we can possibly leverage the framework to do something um, within the, the cyber infrastructure space to manage data across multiple data repositories. So in the first project, we would look at um, how we might use adaptive framework to build a general purpose uh, Auth-Z Auth system. We say Auth-Z for authorization. This would be, um, and this would be real useful for our Vault project and, and other identity and access ma management products, but I hope that uh, we could see uh, a more general purpose Auth-Z system that could be used in within other spaces as well, including the CI space. So imagine you have the service hanging out with access to various data repositories within your org, and it can connect and pull out your user database or a person registry. It can connect to config management databases, CMDBs, um, or some other resource database. And then, you know, the connectivity to these data sources could be done through adapters or extension functions. Then we uh, could have a separate UI that could be created, possibly using layouts. And um, in order to maintain a set of auth policies that are accessed by a security team who would come up with access control logic. In addition, support for alternate uh, administrative uh, policy point uh, administration points such as an existing ZACML policy uh, administration point could be directly supportable by this Auth-Z system. So what you would end up with something um, that's very much like a, a ZACML decision point where it's a service that you could throw requests at it and ask it uh, if someone has access to a particular resource, and then it would be responsible for running or returning the correct decision. And then furthermore, this, you know, it could provide logging of requests and decisions, which would help in the process of auditing and monitoring. I'm just going to throw up some diagrams here to sort of describe what I just went over. The first part, you would have the Auth-Z service. You can see it's got two parts to its communication stack. It's got a REST, a REST and a ZACL interface. So integration can be done either way. Then we have the um, user registry, such as an LDAP store, 
and a resource registry, such as a CMDB, and they provide the data inputs. And I suspect you might have more than one of these. Then you've got um, off policies that could be uh, provided by an existing ZACMA policy point. So some institutions may already have one of these in place. So pulling in existing policies would be pretty convenient. Um, alternatively, a uh, policy UI could be designed for this office system that could be used to uh, make, to create and manage all policies, um, make it real easy to maintain. And you could even provide a way for end users to be able to, you know, use it just to quickly share data with other, other people. And then finally, we got applications, systems, or even auditors that may make authorization requests to the service. And then, um, there could be web apps um, or Linux systems or whatever needs to gather uh, needs to gather a decision to enforce it. And they may do so either using the RESTful interface or some sort of uh, ZACMO compliant interface. The second project that I wanna just go over real quickly here um, reaches a little bit outside of my background um, because it involves the management and access of research data. However, as I understand it, there's two components to cyber infrastructure ecosystem um, that includes data integration and data management. And these two areas coincidentally have a lot, a lot of overlap with some of the work we've done in the past with Vault Data Access. So in this project idea, idea we could join multiple backend um, data repositories and then access their data through a single common endpoint then we could have a, a metadata catalog be constructed to um, describe or, or unify the data, possibly using adaptive models. And then um, access control measures could be placed in front of the data. And then this could leverage uh, either components that are already baked into the adaptive framework, or they could use the authorization project that I just described in the first one. And then finally, we have uh, we could have query tools be, uh, built using adaptive script or even RESTful interfaces that would allow researchers to access and analyze the data in ways that are easy to use or visualize or interpret. So this um, this kind of describes how the parts would look when they're connected together. First, we have the data repositories containing the raw data that we need to access and protect, and then these. Uh, repositories would sit behind a data interoperability layer um, using, uh, for instance, adapters to access the data in its raw form. And then along with adaptive models that could provide uh, any sort of data transformation or computation on that raw data. And we have a metadata catalog uh, along with the normalized data, which is now um, accessible to clients and researchers through a data access layer. And this layer could, uh, it could be a RESTful API, or it could involve um, custom request handlers that implement the search retrieval protocols that might be specific to research applications. Authorization policies created by access control app applications would allow researchers to, who own a particular data repository to um, protect their data and collaborate with other researchers that require access. And then finally, other researchers may use uh, query tools or even access the data directly through the data access layer. And you know, layouts could even be provided to allow the data to be visualized in more natural or interesting ways. Um, finally, a, a few words about contributing to this project. The fir first link on this slide goes directly to our GitHub page. And while we're not quite ready for a 1.0 release, we do have some uh, pre-release Docker containers that can be explored off the main GitHub page. And soon we also hope to have some template repositories set up as well that we hope will get new projects up and working very quickly. The second link on that slide um, will actually direct you to the documentation, which is also hosted on GitHub through GitHub pages. And there's three primary guides that you can look at. Um, there's an architecture guide, talks a lot about what I talked about today, administrative guide, and then there's also a developer guide.
We also have a Discord channel if you just want to casually chat or discuss topics. So that's another avenue for communication. Um, I think that link is literally just an invite link that I copied and pasted um, from Discord. This is a MIT licensed software, and it is still um, still it feels kind of early at this stage, even after um, almost eight years of working on this. Um, and the freedom of the MIT license allows us to open up the project to be used by other open source projects, as well as for commercial use. So we hope that creates some more attraction. Um, and I also want to mention that we're currently working with a company called Omnibond Systems, who are using this framework for some really interesting software in the cloud computing space. And uh, eventually, we hope to have some linked resources off of our GitHub page to um, other projects uh, as their work becomes publicly available. So this concludes the presentation part of the webinar, and I hope you found our project informative. I want to thank you for attending today. If you have any ideas or feedback rather than questions, um, I'd love to hear from them as well, either in the session or through our contact information. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to the floor for questions. Thanks. Um, I have populated the chat with the Discord invite and the project homepage and the docs links. Um, and while people are thinking and typing, I wanted to go over a few community updates from Trusted CI. First, our next webinar is September 25th at 10 a.m. Central. Our topic is improving the privacy and security of data for wastewater-based epidemiology. Our presenters are Stephanie Forrest and Nee True. Then we've got a reminder about the EDUCAUSE annual conference is, at, is in October in Chicago. And then a couple of weeks later, we've got our Trusted CI Cybersecurity Summit. Um, registration is open. So go to trustedci.org slash summit. Also book your hotel <laughs> because Berkeley gets pretty busy pretty quickly. So please make sure that you go and do that. Um, I don't see any questions. Oh wait, here we go. We just got one popped up. Um, question here for IAM use cases, um, internet or uh, sorry, um, identity and access management use cases. Could you compare functionality of the adaptive framework with the in common trusted access platform? I'll be real honest. I, I don't know anything about um, the trusted access platform. Um, what I will say is that um, one thing that makes adaptive framework a little bit different is because it's not a, an end solution. So if it is a platform, there's probably a lot of overlap and similarities there. Um, there's, uh, you know, adaptive framework was really more designed to be take as little or as much as, as you want. So there are, our philosophy is if you were to build, um, you could you could build a, a project from scratch that uses very little, uh, just little Lego pieces from our framework. Um, or you could take the existing compiled uh, apps and tools that are part of it and make a full deployment out of the box and then sort of customize it with adaptive script or config, configuration files and get a bit more of a, a cookie cutter um, sort of implementation, um, but I don't, I don't know um, anything about the the trusted access platform to really make any sort of intelligent comparison or contrast between those two. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank. They said thank you for the uh, presentation. Any other questions for Jeremy? Um, while people are typing. Um, what do you what do you see happening in the next year or so? Besides, I mean, do, do you think a, a major version release will happen? Yeah, um, I'm really hoping that by the end of this year we'll have a a um, at least a stable uh, beta and um, and possibly even a uh, you know a 1.0 release. We're basically trying to flat, uh, finish up the the language requirements. Um, doing a lot of work. Uh, I have a coworker that's doing a lot of work on the on the compiler for that. And so he's getting um, some memory management and features like closure and stuff that ECMAScript has, um, getting that all worked out. And then a 
and then after that, it's really just polishing up documentation and um, getting um, template repositories out there. So it's real easy for somebody just to, you know, go through a recipe book and and step through it and, and, and get a sample project up and going. Yes, documentation is very important. <laughs> I I don't consider a project complete until it's documented. <laughs> yeah, it, a lot of our docs are very, you know, they're, they're the reference is nice because they can be generated. And so they're like always correct, <laughs> so to speak. But um, there's still a lot of human touch, I think that has to happen in order to make it all, you know, kind of glue, make it adhesive, so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, um, I think we are wrapping up um, for now. So I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. And Jeremy, I wanted to thank you again for presenting. Um, and do you have any final uh, thoughts before we end this presentation? Uh, I, I don't. Thank you for setting this up. Really appreciate all the help you've, you've given me. And um, thank you, Mark, for your comments in chat. Um, you know, what to keep... Uh, Keep an eye on the on the GitHub project. We'll we'll have updates there, and there's even a um, a discussion tab too, where we can uh, hopefully create some discussions right there directly in the forum. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, thanks everyone. I'm going to um, end the Zoom session, and when I do, um, I'm <laughs> that's going to automatically kick you all up. But I hope you all have a good day. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.